Okay, I've been practicing my Irish. Are there any Irish in? No one. Oh, <laughs> just one. Then just for you, then Dia <laughs> Guia. I'm glad so many of you uh, showed up during the lunch, lunch break. That's great. Um, I'm uh, I'm standing here. I may not have all the answers, but I'm uh, willing to give it a go. And um, at least I'm able to share my experiences with you. So uh, my talk is called The Seven Hurdles to Reach Scrum Drupal Nirvana. Why seven? I'm not quite sure, but it sounded like a nice number to start with. Of course, there are a lot of hurdles when you try to embed Scrum within your company, but um, I tried to figure out what the biggest seven issues are. So, who am I and why am I standing here? Um, this is some facts about me. Um, I've been working in open source for, for quite some time now. When I was about 14, my brother gave me a computer with Linux on it. So that's where my open source hippie heart opened up. And I'm still a, an open source hippie. And I will always be that, I guess. Um, I call myself a semi ex Drupalista now because I've made for my work my profession. Uh, other, other way around, I, I made for my, my work my hobby again, I'm sorry. Uh, because I'm not into Drupal anymore, professionally. Um, maybe I will be once again sometime, maybe. But for now I'm working at Vacant Select as a Scrum Master, full-time Scrum Master. And we do .NET. <coughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm loving a skit since DrupalCon London, you see in the audience. We're having our five year anniversary today at this DrupalCon. So that's very great. And <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and my, my open source hippie heart opened up for the agile part of it about four years ago. So I'm an agilista and a Drupalista. Um, I'm really curious what kind of audience I'm having. Are there any Scrum Masters? Please raise your, raise your hand. Okay, a couple of them. Product owners? Three, okay, Proje more. Project managers? More, okay. Nice to see you. Handball players? <laughs> no team handball players? <laughs> Guys, you really should, it's, it's awesome. Okay, uh, here's a little thing. What I'm going to be talking about First off, um, to truly understand the hurdles, I would like to give you some more in-depth view and give you an insight on how, how I think the Scrum Master role um, is to be defined. Um, that's why I'll, I will start with a little in-depth on the specific Scrum Master role itself. And I think this is because uh, a lot of people know uh, the theory behind it but what, it's take, what it takes to be a true good Scrum Master um, is to be defined, I guess, to get to the hurdles. Uh, then I will talk some more about the seven hurdles. Uh, using Scrum within digital agencies. I know that's broader than just Drupal agencies because I think this talk uh, is also for other, other shops, WordPress, or so it's, it's digital agencies. And after that, we will have an answer round. Okay. Uh, let me take you into Scrum Mastery a little bit. Um, to start, I just picked up my Scrum Guide and checked what Scrum Mastery is all about. This is what Scrum is according to the Scrum Guide. It's really easy to understand. Everybody understands Scrum, the way it works with all the, with all the circles and the adapt and inspect and um, the sprints and the stand-ups. Everybody gets that, right? That's not that hard. But really, to master Scrum, that's really difficult. So, um, I agree with a lot of experts out there that you should have a dedicated Scrum master in your team. It's not a part-time job. Was that me? Probably, no one, nobody else is wearing a mic. Um, if you say Scrum Master is a full-time job, what do you do all day? That's a question I get a lot. I don't know if you ever have asked the question. If you have asked the question, 
is Scrum Master a full-time job, then you're in the right place because I'm going to show you why it is. I don't think a team lead developer can be a Scrum Master at the same time. And I know that happens a lot, but um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on stage so I can shout out whatever I, li <laughs> I like. I think you need a dedicated Scrum Master. Same goes for Product Owner Scrum Master role combined. That's a conflict of interest that will never work. Or any other company member doing the Scrum Master uh, role next to their normal role. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, as a Scrum Master, I think we're kind of like the Drupal Association, uh, Drupal Association of the company. This is the goal of the Drupal Association. The Drupal Association is dedicated to fostering and supporting the Drupal software project, the community and its growth. So I stroke out a couple of lines there. And I think it's, it's very close to the Scrum Master role within the company. The goal of the Scrum Master is dedicated to fostering and supporting the Scrum process, the community slash team, and its growth. I will take you back to the Scrum Guide again to show you what the Scrum Master does. Let's go back to the Scrum Guide. Um, responsible for ensuring Scrum is understood. That's basically the part everybody understands, right? The Scrum Master explains Scrum to everybody within the team. Make sure uh, the three year in the practices are done, the, the daily stand up uh, is there, <coughs> and that all the scrum rules are, are being followed. But next to that, you're a servant leader. Uh, sometimes I, I see uh, job applications and it says the scrum master um, uh, leads the team. No, the scrum master doesn't lead the team, the, the scrum master servant, servant leads the team. Um, but next to the team itself, you're also responsible for uh, the organization around it. Um, the thing is, the job title Agile Coach isn't in the Scrum Guide. The Scrum Master is the Agile Coach, basically. So it's not just making sure the, the, the retrospective is being held, the, all, the, all the events are being held, but you also have to garden the organization and help them change. Um, my next slide will give you an overview of uh, types of Scrum Masters you can encounter within organizations. I stole that from, uh, from uh, Angel Medellina uh, from his presentation, How to Fe Develop a Great Scrum Master. Um, and I think it gives a great overview of the types of Scrum you have. Um, the scrum dude, that's typically the guy or girl who was uh, a developer and some management thought, okay, we're going to do a scrum now. You're a developer and you're basically the technical team lead, so I think you also should be scrum master. Which is just fine. Uh, it works, so um, he or she schedules meetings and does all the things that has to be done but you will never really grow the team um, because he only fa facilitates everything. The second one is a, is a more <laughs> dangerous one, the Scrum Mom. And I, I'll explain why it is, because as a Scrum Mom, I've been there, done that, really, trust me. I've been Scrum Momming around all the time. Um, uh, really protective of the team, sending away a product owner, sending away stakeholders. No, you've got no nothing to see here, go away. This is my team and I protect them. So um, uh, I will remove all the impediments for you. Give me your impediments and I will take them away. The idea of a Scrum Master I is essentially that you uh, make yourself obsolete. The team should be self-steering. If you ever encounter a scrum mom or recognize yourself in it, please remember that that is not the way to create a self-steering team. Because the moment you do something for your team, which they can do perfectly well themselves, you own it. So every time, every time you do something, you own it. So you become a scrum mom and the, the developers are happily developing and uh, um, um, never will make the next step to becoming a self-steering team. 
and get rid of uh, their own impediments and not just yelling at you, please solve that for me, mom, right? So the true Scrum Master facilitates, grows, helps, encourages, um, and is a gardener. That's basically what, what a true Scrum Master does. I'm not quite there yet, I'll, I'll admit. I'm still somewhere stuck between here, and that's okay, right? Everybody needs to learn. Um, trying to. The almighty Scrum Master checklist. Just one more giveaway about the Scrum Master role. It has checkboxes and it has a Google Doc version in which you can uh, uh, fill out the checkboxes. So that helps, right? It's a sort of a to-do list. And it makes clear what you are doing for the rest of the organization. That won't work. <laughs> I'll just skip it. It's in the presentation. Um, it tells more about what you, how you can help your product owner because uh, they, they need a lo not a lot of love and uh, nurturing too, of course, to help them get their backlog right, to help them get their stakeholder management right, <laughs> but also um, achieve the final goal um, in having an agile enterprise. So, on to the seven hurdles. Hurdle number one, Scrum and the customer. Uh, who of you, you have a customer that really, truly understands Scrum? One, two, three, four-ish, three and a half. My point exactly. It's really hard uh, when you are in an organization and you are, are, are full aware of, of everything that Scrum can offer you and offer your team that you have to make money and you have to have customers for that and they have to understand the way you work. It's very, very hard. Um, so they will ask for functional designs, they will ask for technical design, they will ask how much will it cost me, what will I get, and when will it be ready? So I got some tips and tricks which I found helpful to get over this hurdle. Uh, start with the offer. So don't wait for the, uh, for the signing of the contracts. Start with the offer. Make sure you get uh, uh, really clear the way you work, the way you want to work, the way the things you expect from your customer, the things they can expect from you. So please do so in the offering phase already so they know what they can expect. Get together. Um, the way I've seen Scrum working best is when the team is at the customers or the other way around. Someone of the, the product owner of the customer is at the team. Uh, because you have to work closely together, right? The Agile Manifesto says conversation over contracts. Please keep communicating. So the best way to keep communicating is to get close to each other. So bond with your customer and get together, work together. Um, mind the product owner. I'm going to make a stance now, which is um, sometimes uh, not really well received. I think a customer should never deliver the product owner. It happens a lot, um, but the product owner role is really hard. It's, um, it's not something to think lightly about. It can be a full-time job, depending on the size of the project. And it's a profession. And when customers start a web project or, or an application or anything like that, probably you will end up with someone from the communication department or some IT person who will have eight hours a week for you to fill their backlog and, and do stuff like that. Do the fill in the product owner role. Uh, from my point of view, that's not the best way to go. Have your product owner on your side with your team and let the client be the stakeholder. So you can have a delegated product owner at, at the customer side, but I think um, the best projects are made with product owners who know their job and know their profession. Mm -hmm. And that takes a while to learn. And you can't do that in a couple of months projects. You cannot learn it that well. So. Um, 
a lot of a lot of people disagree with me on this, but <laughs> that's okay. I can talk with you later if you would like more in-depth information about that. Educate, educate, educate. Start with workshops. Explain how it works. Explain what you're doing. Explain what the 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 um, events you are you are doing. Show them your backlog. Show them how you work. Show them your board because I'm definitely a fan of physical boards, and not Jira or yeah. It can help, but um, keep on educating. And not only from the start, but keep on checking as a Scrum Master, is, are my stakeholders still in with the game? Do they still understand what we're working on? Then we're up to hurdle number two, Scrum and Drupal development. Uh, Scrum talks about team members. You have a couple of roles, you have a product owner, a scrum master, and team members. But of course, in every Drupal company, you have front-end developers, back-end developers, there's maybe in your team, but also junior, media, senior. And how do you make sure that everyone in the team is on the same page and uh, uh, can help each other with user stories, but s s sometimes um, there's <coughs> some serialism in, in a user story, so the back end has to go first before the front end can do its work. So that's kind of um, hard when you try to do Scrum. Um, to try and get your team to be a team, be a gardener. Um, the way I use it, or I do this, is, is anyone familiar with Daniel Pink, the puzzle of motivation? Not, not everybody, okay, I'm going to explain something about it. Uh, you should go and watch his, his 18 minute TED talk about motivation of knowledge workers. That's really great. He says, of course money is important, but, but it can never be a motivator. Motivational employees, um, they are motivated by three things. It's autonomy. I can decide what I am doing within the team. Second one is mastery. I have the skill set. I know everything I need to do my job the best way I can. And purpose. Uh, everyone who's working at, uh, uh, at a website or an application wants to do that for a greater good. And that's the way to keep people motivated. I do that individually with my team members. I'm a Scrum Master of three development teams. Um, so I have talks with them. Uh, do you need some more knowledge? Are you autonomous enough? Is the proposal clear for you? Uh, you can do it also on a team level. Is the team autonomous enough? Has the team all the mastery that you need to build the best web projects you can? And is the purpose obvious? And even uh, I'm, I'm about to make it uh, one step further to see C-level, to uh, get it all in line so that everyone in the company knows what the purpose is. <coughs> Daniel Pink, watch that guy, that's, he's so cool. So that's my way of being a gardener in, in my development teams. Do use the most powerful tool in the Scrum Guide. Anyone, whenever, try. It's an event. Thank you. Retrospectives. The only way to become better at what you do is to inspect and adapt. Keep on inspecting and adapting. The retrospective, please people, don't skip it ever. Don't, because, thank you. <laughs> because that's the way to make your teams better. Because they stand still, look back, check what they are doing and inspect what went wrong and do it better next time. So you will get a better, faster, more happy team. Do use it, please. Um, have a, and for the Scrum Masters, I've seen a couple, have a Scrum Master toolbox for it. Uh, I'm really working very hard on it. I'm having three teams and we're having two week sprints, so that makes up for 75 retrospectives a year. Um, you will need a toolbox. There are great sites for it. Um, Tasty Cupcakes is a, is a perfect site to find great ideas for, for good retrospectives. And try to um, 
um, mix and match them. Uh, there are different kinds of retrospectives. Sometimes you have you you feel that there's a problem in the team with the communication. Find one that suits that problem. Sometimes it's technical depth. Sometimes it's a lot of bugs or find a retrospective suited for each situation and each sprint. So um, what I found out, the um, Scrum Master before me, who was actually a very great guy, so I'm not here to, uh, to uh, uh, criticize him, but he used the, the same retrospective over and over again. And just people came fill with filled in post-its before the retrospective. Well, it, when, once they do that, change your retro. <laughs> That's a great, great moment to change your retro. So uh, create your Scrum Master toolbox. I literally have, I work at a, at a, at a camping company, so I literally have a suitcase <laughs> which, says, which says Scrum back on it. And I use that as, a, as my uh, Scrum toolbox. Scrum in the HR department. Now this, this was, for me personally, a very fun situation. Uh, I was working as a product owner, but the, the role uh, re didn't really suit me, so I went looking for a job as a Scrum Master. So I uploaded my resume <coughs> and I got called by a lot of recruiters. If you ever consider it uh, a job change, try Scrum Master. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of work in it. Um, only the funny thing was that all the recruiters I talked to weren't looking for a Scrum Master. They were looking for a project manager. Uh, they were looking for a sort of Scrum Master product owner, um, salesperson account management, someone. Uh, I've, I've had so much crazy calls of, and yeah, it says Scrum here in the job description, so it must be a Scrum Master then. Please do educate your HR department. There was even one where I also had to test the software. <laughs> I don't think so. Other people are better at that. <laughs> um, to educate your HR department, get involved as a Scrum Master. You know best what you need in your team. I will get back to the Daniel Pink, the, the um, uh, autonomy mastery, the mastery part of Daniel Pink. Um, you know what's missing in your team, right? Um, what kind of skill set and what kind of uh, attitude do you need? So get involved in the hiring process. Do that because HR people uh, are not skilled Drupal, pe uh, skilled Scrum people. Make clear what different functions are all about. Missing an S there, but you can read it anyways. And mind skills versus attitude because uh, I've met some crazy, intelligent, very smart, ideologically s s fast developers who couldn't communicate at all. <coughs> so, uh, well, they could, but they weren't willing to. So that's an attitude thing. Skills can be learned, that's not a problem. You can teach anybody anything. That's at least what I believe. But attitudes you can change. You cannot change, I mean. So find the right person for the job and help your HR department with that. Four. I think this is the biggest hurdle of them all. I've never been to any Scrum events, Scrum meetings, Scrummy Agile meetup thing where this wasn't a subject. But how do we do support? It's not in the Scrum Guide. But we deliver websites and we do deliver applications and we do have to do support. How? Um, I'm not pretending I do have the sublime answer to this, but I do have some certain ways to try and fill it in and see what works out. Again, inspect and adapt. If it works for you, stick with it. If it doesn't work for you, try something else. These are uh, a couple of the ways I found to do so and try it. Uh, a burning issue backlog. Have a separate backlog for your uh, support questions 
and if they're uh, um, um, due this print because they're absolutely blocking, have them on a separate backlog and have time boxes within the teams if you have more than one team, uh, say they have time boxes of a day, to work on the burning issue backlog. <coughs> that is a way. Um, I found that not to be ideal um, because you do have situations where the burning issue backlog is too big to, to fit into the time box and then you have to engage with your, with your product owner again to see what goes out of the sprint and you will lose the momentum of the sprint and the ca cadence of the whole sprint process. So it is an option, but I'm not quite fond with it. Uh, this is the one I like best, but the problem is uh, it's not always possible because of this, I'm sorry, it's always, I'll just finish this sentence. It's not always possible um, because the size of the company, of course. If you have two teams, you're not able to have an extra team for your support department. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah, doesn't the time boxing thing uh, ensure that your uh, burning issue backlog doesn't interfere with your sprint time? That's the whole point of the time boxing, as I see it. Or it or True, or but... Or some, something else you mean with time boxing? Well, if, if Drupal Geddon comes along, yeah. And, and, and your time box isn't big enough, then it will interfere with your sprint anyways. That, that's, that's, it's, of course, you try to time box it and try to keep it that way so that you're, um, you can see in the future uh, how much work you can, you can do. But there's always, everyone knows, I guess, that, that there's always burning issues coming along. Uh, for instance, if you do e-commerce um, and, and, and the, the payment thing isn't working, you have to fix that, right? So. It, 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 it can work, but it's not always the ideal option. At a certain company you do know, we, we are right now working uh, <coughs> in this way. It actually seems to be uh, working pretty well. Great. Yeah. Well, that's good for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. <coughs> Probably a uh, good code, right? He's an old colleague of mine. <laughs> and he's a great programmer. <laughs> um, I was talking about a dedicated team with a Kanban, and um, uh, um, it works when you have enough body as a as a company to do that. Um, I've seen that working at big, some big e-commerce uh, companies in the Netherlands, um, and that seems to be working just fine to fix the support problem. Um, currently, at my company, we are trying to work with chapters. So we have um, everybody knows the Spotify model. Maybe you have you have uh, the teams uh, vertically, and you can have uh, chapters horizontally. Um, so we have in every team we have a, a, sp a support engineer, and they work together over the teams to get the support done. We're trying to let them figuring that out themselves. So that's where I'm moving from from the Scrum Mom role to the Scrum Master role. Um, we just put them to. Uh, I just ask them, organize yourself and make make it happen. And they're actually doing that right now. But it's fairly new, so um, I will let you know maybe next year how it worked out. <laughs> um, and I've also seen the support engineer per sprint. You have one team member dedicated in your sprint who is only working on support issues of all the customers. Uh, the good thing about that is that. Uh, the knowledge about all different projects is, is better spread within the team. Um, you, have to, you can make sure that everyone within the team knows uh, what, cost, uh, what projects there are and have knowledge, technical knowledge of the, um, of the site or the applications. Mm -hmm. So that you know you have the, the knowledge spread around the team. Right. So it just it's one of the things that works for us as well. So. Great. Thank you. I, I will repeat it because it's it's being recorded. Um, w a perfect addition from the audience is that uh, the support engineer uh, uh, does rotate the role of the support uh, engineer does rotate within the team, and it works for you. Yes. Great. 
Thank you. I think you earned stroop bubbles. There you go. Um, Scrum and technical debt. It's always a hot one, right? Because, and this is also why I think the product owner should be within the agency. Because this is the hardest part to explain to a product owner. What technical, technical debt is and why it's important. Please be bold about technical debt. There cannot be one sprint coming through without solving technical debt if there, is, if there is any. And everybody knows there's always technical debt. So please get rid of it and be bold about it. If you sense in the teams that they're, that they're only working on new features and never on solving problems, um, let the team uh, explain the product owner that they really need that. Educate your product owner about it. Uh, one thing I saw at another speech was figure, figuring out the business value because technical debt does have business value. A lot of product owners say, well, you, you will work on that for three days to solve a problem, but it has no value. What I've seen is um, um, business value can be on, on different quadrants. You can have business value for the team, business value for the customer, uh, business value for uh, the internal organization, business value for the customer of the customer, and you can make quadrants of it. And you can decide with the team and with the product owner to give out business value points to each quadrant. Business value isn't flat. It is, isn't just value for the end user, but it's also value for the team. If they can do their work three times faster, that's great value, right? So figure out business value of your, of your technical debt. And use, there are so, so, uh, uh, very much smart models for that. Um, to make it, to make the product owner understand. <sighs> this is also a nice one, right? <laughs> Last year in uh, Barcelona, I, I talked about fixed scope, fixed price. Don't know if anyone has seen the session, but uh, Scrum and project budgets, that's always a problem. Uh, a lot of management 2.0 is about Excel sheets and customers really uh, want to know the costs and what they can expect and what they um, what will be delivered at what time. And basically in the, in the beginning of the project there's no or building the product, there is no problem at all uh, because uh, the customer still has budget. but once the budget is slinking and it's getting smaller, then the problem starts. <coughs> to figure out, to, to get control of the budget of the different product, uh, projects you are working on, keep the number of the projects low. Uh, I've worked at a company, sorry, <laughs> where we did uh, 14 projects in one sprint. That's not doable. And actually, he told me yesterday that they brought it down uh, a lot. So that was a great tip for my presentation. Keep the number of projects low per sprint because, and ideally, and I know that's not always possible, have your project serialized instead of parallel. So do one project, try to do one project at a time. And I know that's. That's Nirvana. Um, but at least give it a try and keep the number of projects in one sprint very low. Let the customer pay per sprint and not per hour. The biggest waste, I think, in IT is hour registration. Thank you. <laughs> Those are the developers, I guess. <laughs> Um, of course, the customer has to know what to pay for, um, but I think uh, if you can get them to pay per sprint or pay per half a sprint even, uh, you, will get a, you will get a lot of frustration out of the way within your team and they can do what they're good at. Um, plus, you don't have to be a sort of 
nasty person everybody chasing everyone around you should uh, you should write your hours because that's the worst job in the world right skip the hours please <laughs> bill per sprint just no more hour registration that's my final goal in this uh, that's on my bucket list our, our registration out of this world um, explain the rise of value for money if you skip the hour registration and you have the billing per sprint or billing per half a sprint you can explain that because you do your retrospectives right that your every sprint you will the customer will get more value for money because your team is inspecting adapting getting better delivering more each and every sprint but the price stays the same so they get more value for money each time you do a sprint and please don't mess with sprint lengths. Oh. Time tracking, yeah, I'm sorry. Is that a European thing or just Dutch? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, time tracking, right. Don't mess with sprint lang, please. About the time tracking, I would love to get rid of the time tracking. I know. As you know, uh, we and I think most Drupal shops have always had multiple projects, multiple uh, customers per sprint. Mm -hmm. So uh, the only way to uh, make sure that the customer gets what he deserves is to do some sort of time tracking. Mm -hmm. Make sure uh, you distribute the hours uh, accordingly to, to the project. So how are you going to manage that without the time tracking? Uh, well I think it's best to do that based on philosophy, I think. Not quite sure. Does anyone have a better answer than I have? Okay, I just uh, I just yeah. got a signal because uh, nothing of this will be recorded, uh, so it's not to be rude. But uh, in if someone has more smart things to say, maybe you should use the microphone that's over there. <coughs> okay, let's do that. Okay. Uh, well, I already stressed this out enough, I guess. Don't mess with your sprint length. Because otherwise everything up will just won't work anymore. The last one. Scrum versus Scrum bots versus Water Scrum. Um, please always strive for the real Scrum. Because that is what truly makes people happy. That's what I believe. Um, I've heard someone say, yeah, we do stand-ups and uh, yeah, we do uh, things with post-its on walls. And but if you really, truly want to grow with the whole company and with the whole team, try to use it as much and as good as possible, as well as possible. Um, Scrum will work for you if you manage to take the six hurdles. And I know it's hard. Been there, done that. Once again, Please have a dedicated Scrum Master who can help you with it and make sure you get one who goes to events to get more knowledge from other Scrum Masters. Uh, read the Scrum Guide and check it. Check if, it's, if, if you really are following the, the Scrum Guide rules because most of the time you think you're doing it the right way, but keep on checking. Again, don't ever skip the retrospective. <laughs> don't. Please don't. Uh, and have your management belief in an agile enterprise. I'm going to, uh, going to end this slide with, with a little story about this man. 
this is my CEO. He's called Luke. And um, he's truly an agile and scrum believer. Um, that's why he hired me, so I'm very glad I'm, I'm working there at the moment. Uh, Luke started out 30 years ago with a camping site um, near the uh, Lake Garda in Italy. And he started with, with a field. And then he built some infrastructure on it, and then he built some toilets on it, and some, some other uh, sanitary things. And, um, and so he built a camping, and then it just went bigger, and people weren't able to stay at his, his camping anymore. So he um, booked them to other, webs uh, to other uh, campings. And in 30 years' time, he grew to an uh, e-commerce company now. And we do bookings all over Europe, specialized in glamping, glamorous camping. So that's a two-story tent with a jacuzzi and a kitchen in it. <laughs> but OK, that was his dream. Yeah, it's awesome. It really is awesome. Um, so it's a European company now. And um, the first time he hired, he hired an agile coach. And he said, explain to me, what, what should we do? I want to become the best e-commerce company in the Netherlands. What should I do? So he explained, the HR coach explained the whole scrum process to him. And he said, well, but that's just like building a campsite, right? So he truly, in his heart and in his gut, understands how HR works. And that's why I love to work for this guy. And I will end with a quote from him, because I love it so much. When keep people call me crazy, I know I'm on the right track. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. I, I want to do this a little differently. Um, I, I call this sheet answers and not questions. Can you please just take a look around and see how many people are here? I can assure you. There's so much more knowledge in this room than on stage. So why would I take the questions? So I got more Stroopwafels <laughs> for the best answers in the room. Uh, is there anyone with a great tip, trick, or hint on one of the seven hurdles? Uh, just to pick up on the, the sizing and the time tracking from before, um, Scrum doesn't, has, it doesn't have anything to do with hours. There's no way in, in Scrum it has to do with hours. We use story points. Yeah, I know it's a fluid size, but uh, when I size a project, uh, we leave a tender, an offer. Uh, the customer gets, let, let's say, not three months or six months and so many resources, 1,500 story points. What's that? And then you have a discussion about how do you, the customer, prioritize your story points so you can come with all your stupid uh, requests, uh, all very brilliant <laughs> requests, uh, <laughs> in the duration of your project. But you will only have this fixed size of story points. So use them wisely. And that sort of tames and disciplines your customer as well. And uh, that really helps. We never talk about ours. You get this amount of resources how you want to internally in your agency uh, move people around, that's your headache. Uh, the customer already knows the bill beforehand. Uh, so I think that's true bubbles. My, and if you come <laughs> at 2.15, I will speak much more about this at another <laughs> session. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone who has a great tip about how to handle technical debt? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Is there anything, uh, anyone who has a great tip about how to cope with technical debt? You have an idea. <laughs> it's the waffles, right? Yeah. Just plan it in advance. Build it into your time. If you know that you're going to have to manage technical debt, you can't predict what you're going to need to do. Just plan a sprint in between the sprints for technical debt. I've done this on several projects. It's okay. been really helpful. Technical debt sprint solves that problem. Right. Great. A sort of legacy sprint. Why? Have you ever had them? Yes. They're great. <laughs> okay. And I'm not hungry. Anyone else? <laughs> 
Um, and any, any more great tips on support? How to, how to handle support within sprints? Or any of the other hurdles? More service level. Or like support system, like how they can do scrum. Mm, interesting. Any other great tips? Guys, I need to get rid of these. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions then? I have, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Are developers very can you uh, walk to the microphone, please? Or someone hand it to him or. Hi, um, I'm a developer, so I don't know many. I don't know a lot about these Scrum things. Uh, <coughs> but my question is: um, Do you people do estimates and then um, look back at how close you were to the estimate of of the development? Like, if you say I estimate it will take eight hours mm -hmm. to to complete this, and then do you time track and and? No. Evaluated or we don't use hours at all within Scrum. We use elephants and mice, for instance. I think this feature is an elephant, and I think this feature is a mice, or story points. Or, but uh, to look back and see how well you've done, you know in your heart as a developer um, um, how well you have done. You know it. I don't have to ask you that, and we don't have to report anything about that. The next time you will have a planning session. You will know better whether it's an elephant or, or a giraffe or, 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 a, or a mouse or 200 or 2,000 story points or t-shirt sizing. sizing that also uh, tend to work, yeah. And break it down, don't, don't work with an elephant, so if you've got a story with an elephant, you break it down, it's like 100 mice will make an elephant and if you work with mice, because you don't know where to start with an elephant, break it down as little as possible. Like Lego, okay? So you start with a little bit. You look at the big design. The, the big design oh, we've got the mic the again. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sorry for that. But I think it's true for worthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Almost out of time, right? Yeah. Okay, so quick question. Yeah. You mentioned product owners and how sometimes they are really stakeholders or should be. Mm -hmm. How are you identifying someone in, within the customer's realm mm -hmm. who is a good product owner versus, ah, oh, this guy should be a stakeholder? Like, what are you, what's the red flags? You always can find the one wrenchable, wrenchable neck. Um, if you say, okay, I'm going to stop this project now, <laughs> the first one at your desk is your product owner. Um, because that's the one who, who really cares, who really feels it in his gut. So that's, that's most of the time that's your stakeholder. But um, again, I think it's better to have the stakeholder at the, at the um, agency side. <coughs> What does, the, what, uh, how do you define? How do you know it's a bad product owner? Oh, that's, that's, that's up to the team. They know, they know instantly. Because your user stories are not written well. Uh, the, the product backlog isn't, isn't, isn't tidy and, and, and working out. Yeah. Brad product owner will, uh, will uh, be uh, known instantly within the team. No, you, mm, not really, no, no. I saw someone in the back, or, no? Maybe the one's question one more question? When you have a small team, uh, one developer, one front-end developer, how do you adapt Scrum? Because it's more for five, six, uh, eight mm -hmm. uh, person. How do you adapt Sorry? how you try to, to do uh, poker planning for one person? Wow. The question, yeah, um, I will, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was how do you uh, do Scrum with a small team? 
with just three or four people. Um, I think I think that's that's really hard, anyways, <laughs> because the scrum has a sweet spot is between uh, um, seven and nine, um, five and nine developers, right? I never worked with a, with a small team like that, so I'm not quite sure actually. Well, yes, you can. He's up for the fruit waffles. That's the, uh -huh. only That's the only reason I'm standing. I up know. For the <laughs> uh, just just to answer that, the strict answer would be you can't. So th That's there's no way of doing no. Scrum with that smaller team. Yeah, it, it's not gonna it's not gonna happen at all. I would suggest that you go for Kanban or something that's much more malleable. It doesn't have as many rules. <coughs> that's cool. You can do agile and you can do interactive work with your clients. It's absolutely no problem to work with small teams and Scrum. And he two, will explain in his session soon. Yeah. <laughs> but but you will get a lot of overhead if that's what you're asking for. Um, but but the, the process stays the same if you're one or you're ten. I've been on a scrum team with fifteen. Yeah. Okay. And wow. it worked, but it takes some yeah getting used to. It's it, there's a lot of overhead when you're two. That's why you work with five to nine people <coughs> because then the overhead is okay thank you um i think we work in uh, um we have a scrum team of of five people mm -hmm. um so it's not quite as small but uh what we do is um we either look at uh, velocity-driven capacity or capacity-based planning. And so what we do at the beginning of a sprint, at sprint planning, is you, you look at how many uh, development days you have available. We always do two-week sprints, so we, we plan for nine days. You leave a, a one day out for meetings and all the, the ceremonies. And, and based on those nine, uh, nine days of development, you plan the work based on that. So it's, uh, it's really about, um, and, and then, <clears throat> Before we actually commit to anything, I always give a give them a mirror of of what they've committed to. So each individual team member is actually looking at, okay, I'm actually committing to X number of hours or X number of story points or whatever way you want to measure it, um, before you ever press the big green button to start the sprint. Mm -hmm. And I find that um, I, I think it is down to whether you go with a velocity driven capacity where you're measuring story points per sprint on a team basis or whether you're dri um, driving it through a capacity-based model where you're looking at all the available resources you have for that sprint and, and how many devel development hours or you know story points you have um, and I think that works you know to to um, to the other guy's point there um, like I think it doesn't matter whether your team is three people or ten people that it, if you do it but it's all about the planning, and yeah. uh, I, that's the way I've worked it anyway, and it seems to be working fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hey, a couple of questions from a product owner perspective. Um, okay. Number one, any good tips on how to keep the stakeholders aware of what's going on so that they don't feel that things are moving too fast or I wasn't involved or I didn't know that we we're at this stage already? Uh, d d you do have a scrum master. Yes, that helps. <coughs> uh, yeah, try to try to involve him or her uh, to to educate. It's it yeah, it keeps on coming back to education to help them understand what you are doing with with your teams. I don't know. Uh, are you working with with a, some sort of rolling roadmap? Uh, well, this is this it. Is it visible for your stakeholders what the teams I I are working on now and the following couple of sprints? Well, this, this relates to a specific project that we did uh, with a Scrum model some time ago. And I mm -hmm. was kind of the liaison as a product owner towards our organization, kind of telling what's going on. Uh, and then we had an external Scrum master. But some of the team members from our side were kind of uh, confused at some point that have we already decided these things because things were moving faster than people who are accustomed to kind of committee type of working mm. they, they thought that things take longer so they I just thought that 
where did I drop the ball of informing people how, how to You are too better. fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually great, yeah. Well, the other question is, um, um, Actually, I forgot the other question, but I'll, you, I'll you step back and think it about it. You can keep it because, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's no problem at all because yeah. we're running out of time anyway. So, <laughs> really quick, on a yeah. really big project, we had several departments mm -hmm. all with a common goal. So mm -hmm. it was a lot of stakeholders, mm -hmm. like twenty, <laughs> and we had decision meetings. So they were regular, they were set, and they were right before sprint planning. And it was when you needed to make a bunch of decisions that were going to help prioritize. We would have that decision meeting. Um, and it was always like, okay, here are the major things coming up. Where do you, what's your stake? Yeah. And that helped us a lot. Let them yeah. sell their business value, why they think it's, it's yeah, important. Yeah, that's actually a good tip, because one thing I thought that I kind of missed was to highlight the decisions even more, that we are now making decisions or we have made decisions. Um, but yeah, the other question was about managing the internal pressure and uh, expectations as a product owner. Any tips for that? Because there's obviously uh, that kind of thing happening. Uh, how is your management about the, the management of the of the company feeling about Agile and Scrum? Well, it varies, okay. let's say that way. Because they can help a lot with, with keeping uh, calming down the stakeholders, uh, uh, because they can say, okay, we're going to choose that way, so stick with it. Um, next to that, you're the product owner, so uh, you're the one responsible and you have to have the authority to say to them okay we're going that way or that way mm. so is your uh, mandate big enough mm -hmm. within the stakeholders and if you have a problem there I think you should talk to yeah, I mean whoever in, a ma in matrix charge or matrix organization for example it might be <laughs> difficult to have a mandate that kind of covers everything because you have dotted lines going everywhere mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that that might be a bit tricky the environment to work in yeah yeah I don't have a, have a set solution for yeah, it, but yeah. uh, uh, try to get your mandates in order and, and use escalation lines for it to, to yeah. get it. Yeah. Because you're the one who's to blame at the end of the day, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All so right. get yeah. Try to get the mandate. That's yeah. the best tip I can give. Uh, yeah. I can give you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we have to wrap it up. I I'll be here. <laughs> because otherwise <laughs> we're going to be kicked out of the room, I guess. <laughs> just one question. Can I ask a poll question where people will just put their hand up really quick? How, how many of you are in your self-organizing teams include design in that two-week sprint? Okay. I'm impressed for Europe. <laughs> just like yeah. one sentence uh, concerning the, the hours versus uh, story points. Uh, in one one of our clients, uh, what we do is uh, we have uh, story points uh, that are only base two. So we have uh, uh, tasks that are two story points, four, uh, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, <laughs> and uh, sixty-four, mm -hmm. and those roughly uh, are converted to hours. Just, uh, but not. Uh, it's not strict. So it's like. Uh, uh, two story points is, is going to be a really easy task, could be finished by one hour, two hours, and uh, 32 uh, story points, uh, is, it's like two days. The problem with that is that people are going to think in, uh, still think in hours. So y if you really want to do it, just, just don't do the, the, the thing back, because uh, I have a team and, and w a, a sprint isn't a fixed couple of story points, right? Then the idea is that because you you um, uh, inspect and adapt and get better as a team, that your velocity grows and that you can do more in the sprint. And, but your hours are still the same. So if you if you turn them back to hours again, you will you will be stuck with the same problem and you will never make your team fly. Um, because I have a team which started a couple of months ago with 70, and now they're at 260. I don't know what what so how, how many hours one story point so is. So an experienced developer could do like a, a ten a ten ten story points job in one hour, while a, a non experienced will do it in five hours. That's what you're saying. But it it will level out in the team. Yeah. Uh, but you. don't match it back to hours, please, because you will you will lose the strength of of the story points. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay. Thank you all. And I have to uh, tell people they can join sprints. Yeah? Leuk.